I'm looking at this group, I'm not sure if I see everyone. I don't think our presenter, Dr. Card, really needs an introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so retired after 32 years of being a president and CEO of Empathia, a behavioral sciences firm, services firm, providing for hundreds of organizations across North America, who remains a practicing psychotherapist for oh. four years, who wrote an award-winning weekly column in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel titled, Out of My Mind, now published in the Shepherd Express. We are happy to have him Zoom for us his presentation on unconscious bias. Please welcome Dr. Philip Carr. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, we're going to be touching on a topic this morning that's um, obviously very relevant and germane to what's going on in, in our country today. And it's something that really applies to all of us. And um, no matter how self-aware, enlightened we feel we are, um, everybody carries around certain kinds of unconscious biases. And the real challenge is to recognize them and then figure out what to do with them. So we're going to take a look at that. I'm going to be using a PowerPoint and we're going to have some time at the end where I'm going to present you with some questions to ponder and talk about with each other, hopefully, and then certainly open the Q&A um, at any point. Um, I don't know, Marguerite, if you folks have used the chat function on here before. Um, or if that's something you'd rather people wait until the end to do, but that's your call. I can go either way. Okay, I can okay. keep an eye on it. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen here. So let's hope the technology is kind. We're all victims of it, as you know. Okay, here we go. Okay, can you see that all right? Everybody? Okay. I have to do one other thing to make this all work, and that is make sure I'm sharing screen sound with you because I have a couple of videos in here I want to show you as well. So let me get that set up. Come on in, Sue. Then we should be ready to go. All right. Okay. How mental blind spots shape perception and behavior is what we're going to be getting into here this morning. And I really want to start out by just pointing out the types of bias that we understand people exhibit. The conscious kind, that's... You have to unmute Philip. Okay. Okay. Am I broadcasting at this point? Okay. So conscious bias is something that, again, we are aware of. Oh, I know I have this... Um, opinion about this, and it's a biased opinion, but the unconscious variety is much, much more common than the conscious variety, unfortunately. And these biases can relate to almost anything. We call these foci, you know, race or ethnicity, age, particularly towards the young and the old. We see more unconscious bias towards young people and old people and folks kind of in the middle. Um, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion or religious affiliation or the absence thereof are all points of bias for people. And then physical characteristics as well, just you know, the basic stuff, appearance, weight, height, dress, whether you have tattoos or body art or all that kind of stuff. Um, and then any other characteristic that we assigned, again, mostly unconsciously to an individual or a social group. And this can include um, biases we have about people who have different political persuasions than we do or have different lifestyles than we do. So as you can tell from this description, the things we attach bias to are very broad, um, but we do know there are some commonalities there and we're gonna take a look at those as well. I wanna show you a, a real quick short little video about bias that'll just sort of tee this up and then I'll get more into the weeds and and talk more about the details behind all this. So here we go with that. Our brain is hardwired to trust what's familiar and be suspicious of what's unfamiliar. It's a basic survival instinct that's helped keep us safe for thousands of years. We unconsciously sort things into familiar versus unfamiliar, same versus different, them versus us. 
Here's a test. How do you feel about people who own a handgun? Don't attend church. Vote for the other candidate. Are on welfare. Don't eat meat. Have tattoos. Don't believe in marriage. Drive an electric car. Didn't go to college. Don't speak English. Curse. Are over six. Are disabled. Drive the speed limit. Love cats. Love dogs. Can you feel your brain sorting people into groups? Was there a little them versus us happening? It can happen unconsciously. Not only can it happen unconsciously, it usually does. The research shows us that perceptual bias um, is often triggered when we first meet a person um, or we even just see a person. It could be on media. It don't have to be an actual physical meeting. But here's what we know the brain registers in this rank order when we first meet people. First thing we notice is their race. The second thing is their gender, then their age, which is sometimes a guess, but we go to the ballpark there, and then their body type. Those four things, the brain is wired to notice right away in other people. And these then become the most common triggers, if you will, for unconscious bias. We are more likely to be that, another way of saying this, we're more likely to be biased based on one of these attributes than many others. That's not to say we can't be on the basis of others, we can, but these are the ones that show up first because as that little short video said to you, our brains are wired to look for differences. And those differences at one point, you know, recognizing those when we were more say tribal or nomadic or whatever was sort of a survival skill because different sometimes meant, not always, but sometimes meant dangerous. And so the brain kind of over periods of many generations got wired into look out for somebody that's not like us or not like me. And that's where the basis of this comes from. So it's not like, oh, we wake up in the morning and say, I think I'm gonna develop a bunch of unconscious biases. You know, It just happens to us and it's just a natural part of the way that the brain tends to operate. Oops, keep hitting the wrong key there. So let's get into some definitions. Of course, obviously an unconscious bias usually is a stereotype that we have about certain persons or groups, whatever. And these form again, outside conscious awareness. Most of the time we don't even know they're there unless they really erupt in some way in our life. We'll get into that. And everybody, I mean, everybody holds unconscious beliefs about persons and groups and this arises again from that brain, that built-in heritable brain tendency to define us from other, okay? And the bias is the way we do that. And unconscious bias is much, much more prevalent than the conscious prejudice that you sometimes hear people speak about, where somebody will boast about the fact that they're even a racist or a sexist or something of that nature. They're aware of that bias. In fact, some people exalt in a bias of that kind. They think it's a defining characteristic of who they are. But the real problem arises when the unconscious bias that you recognize, okay, is, is incompatible with your conscious values, okay? So let's say one of your conscious values is, well, we'll get into that in just a minute. Um, when that happens, when you become aware that you have a bias and you also become aware that that bias conflicts with one of your conscious or stated values, then that creates this thing we call cognitive dissonance, which is just a way of saying you get a little food fight going on in the brain between these two aspects of yourself. And so let's take a look at that a little more closely. Uh, starting over there on the left where it says unconscious bias toward persons of color. So let's say somebody has that. And their conscious value, however, is to endorse racial equality and inclusion. So they have this unconscious bias that is incompatible with their stated and conscious values. When that happens, you get this disconnect between your values and your own actions or beliefs. And that creates this thing we call cognitive dissonance. There's a conflict going on in the head between, wait a minute, I don't think of myself as being racially biased. But in fact, I just had an experience that showed me that maybe I am. And so when that conflict arises inside the brain, the result is, as you might, we get anxious, we get angst because nobody likes to, you know, have that 
sort of uh, battle, civil war, if you will, going on in their head. And so we strive once we feel that anxiety, most people don't like anxiety particularly, once they begin to feel that, they decide I gotta do something about this. And sometimes what they do about it is they rationalize and just push it away and don't deal with the unconscious bias and just say, well, that's not really who I am or that must be a, a fluke or it's just about this one person, it's not about this whole group. We rationalize it to lower anxiety. Instead of doing what's really helpful, which is bringing that bias fully into our awareness, looking at it and dealing with it because we recognize it's there. So let's look at that challenge real quickly. When a bias gets triggered, meaning let's say we meet somebody, let's go ahead with the racial bias thing. We meet somebody of another race, okay? When that bias gets triggered, it actually lights up the threat center in the brain. There's a, and this again, it's an inherited thing, you remember? Different, danger, that sort of thing. So it can light up a little bit of the threat center in the, in the brain. And again, if the bias conflicts with your values, I'm not a racist, then the cognitive dissonance kicks in. The mind tends to try to defend against this anxiety with another kind of bias we call confirmation bias, which means looking for information that supports my point of view and ignoring information that refutes it, which in this case would be ignoring the information you're getting that maybe you do harbor a racial bias. So rationalizing makes it more acceptable and the cognitive dissonance once we resolve it, meaning we get the anxiety we're feeling to go down, that actually lights up the pleasure center in the brain. We feel better. And sometimes that reinforces the existing bias. So you can get into this loop, if you will, where a bias gets triggered, you feel dissonance because that's not who I am. I don't think that way, I don't believe that. And then in order to not deal with that consciously, which just makes a lot more anxiety, we push it away and ignore it and that lowers the anxiety and then we feel better. And when we do this process enough, we kind of double down on the bias. It actually becomes more entrenched as opposed to something we can consciously address and deal with. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. You can just nod. <laughs> You know, it's really weird doing Zoom things. Uh, when you go from an in-person environment where you have an audience, you know, sort of folks out there in front of you, you can read facial expressions, you know, you can do all that stuff. And when you're doing it on Zoom, sometimes it's like, I'm talking into a black void out there. I know you're not a black void, but that's how it feels sometimes. Okay, so let's talk about where this stuff gets started. I mentioned to you that this is a genetically inherited trait, biases but we know that it really forms mostly, it shows up if you will, in early childhood. It becomes most prominent during middle childhood. You begin to see these biases occurring in children at a very young age. And again, it's not necessarily because they grew up in an environment where people were, again, to use the racial example, openly racist in their comments, meaning it wasn't planted there it's more of a function, it can be, but in most instances, what's a function of is again, just that ancient kind of defense mechanism in the brain. These biases become more apparent as we grow older during childhood and, and adolescence in particular. And we begin to recognize and see them in people's perceptions and behaviors as they grow older. But even in early childhood, even in fairly young kids, Remember that you saw that in the video where the little kid cries when they see somebody unfamiliar? Right away, those biases are there. It's like, what's safe? What's dangerous? And what I see or am told is dangerous becomes the bedrock of that bias. Now, we know that when we have these unconscious beliefs and we don't consciously deal with them, they do have real world effects on people's behavior. We see this in employment discrimination, for example, where there are hiring practices, even in organizations who say, we're an equal opportunity employer, you know, we're an affirmative action employer, whatever that, we still see these tendencies among hiring managers in those kind of environments that are openly and expressly saying, we wanna run an unbiased work environment here, non-discriminatory, it still happens. And that's reflected 
or that's, I should say, a result of the fact that we are not dealing with that bias consciously. You know, maybe in an organization, they have diversity training they put their employees through, or maybe they do a program for their hiring managers to make sure that they're not sorting for this, but their brains are sorting for it. So if they're not paying attention to it and they're not dealing with it, it's gonna show up. Conflict is another common consequence of unconscious biases. Because again, think about it, us and them, other and me, okay, is a setup for, con for conflict when groups disagree about something or they're battling over resources or whatever the case may be. The other element of that, of course, is exclusion. We exclude people and include people based on these biases. Oh, you're like me, you look like me, you kind of act like me, you dress like me, I'll include you. You look really weird, get away. You know, that's the way this tends to operate. And of course, we know that unconscious bias can lead to violence. In fact, when we look at anthropological studies about conflict between people, there's almost always elements of unconscious bias involved. Um, where people are being told that person is other, they're dangerous. I'm sorry, I've got my, my uh, Apple watch on and every once in a while when I'm talking, Siri will jump in and say, I'm sorry, I can't understand what you're saying. <laughs> to which I reply to Siri, I don't want you to understand what I'm saying. But anyway, um, these kind of events where we define people as other, and we you see politicians doing this, right? Where they say, oh, those people aren't like you. They're the enemy, they're dangerous. They're here to make your life. And that's playing on these biases, okay? In a very powerful way. And you may say, well, that brings the bias into consciousness when they point it. No, it often doesn't. People are just reacting emotionally without realizing which trigger or hot button that political leader is pushing inside of them. And that's why we see that often when people are trying to create um, or they're trying to win an election or whatever the case may be, this division of us and them is a very powerful political tool. And we, of course, have seen that used quite a bit in the last you know, many decades. Here's the good news. Unconscious biases are malleable. We, can, we have studies showing that when people bring these into their awareness and then deal with them in a particular way, that they are then able to actually minimize the impact of that unconscious bias. That doesn't mean that it just disappears. You know, when you bring it into awareness, it's still there. But it means that because you recognize that it's there and you know how it influences your perceptions and behaviors, you can actually guard against that tendency. So that's what the good news is, <clears throat> excuse me, in all of this. Okay, so unconscious bias operates in what we call system one thinking, okay? And here's why unconscious bias is so much easier and more popular than conscious ones, okay? Um, first of all, system one thinking is fast. It's just boom, you know, just right away make a decision or make a judgment. Again, it's unconscious, so it just happens. You don't have to pay attention to it. You don't have to do anything to make it happen. It just happens. It's automatic. Um, and it often influences everyday decisions that we make about who to be with, who to help, you know, who to reach out to, who to exclude, and so on. It's very error prone because when we don't look at it, when we don't look at the bias, we're kind of at its mercy. It's driving us around. We're kind of the, uh, the wagon being pulled by that horse. System two thinking makes a bias conscious, but it's much more difficult because it, it's slower. You have to think about it. You have to engage your critical thinking process. It requires mental effort at minimum, okay? But it's much more reliable so that when we become aware of these biases, you know, and we examine them in an open way, then our ability to deal with them goes way, way up, as you might expect. Give you a couple examples of types of bias. There's actually a long list of these, which I'm not going to go through, but I just thought a few examples would be worthwhile. Affinity bias, which is the basic foundational one most of us have, also known as similarity bias. And this is that tendency, again, to connect with other people who are like us while disconnecting with those that we see as other or different. Affinity bias you will find almost universally across 
the human population. Confirmation bias, which I referred to a moment ago, is this tendency once we've drawn or once we have a bias about a situation or person to exclude information that would refute that bias, that would make us think about it or wake up to it or deal with it. So it helps us to ignore that information, if you will. Attribution bias is a really interesting one. It involves judging a person based on your prior experiences with that individual, okay? We know that most of all, when we meet a, first, a person for the first time, we make a judgment about them in less than a minute. In some studies, it's actually in uh, 15 seconds is the average, where again, based on what we notice about them, age, race, ethnicity, all that stuff, we make a quick judgment about them. If we have an interaction with that individual that's not very positive, <coughs> excuse me, then that can also taint our opinion of them. And then we kind of brand them without realizing we're doing it. We brand them as other. And then when we interact with them again, sometimes we are not able to open ourselves up to the possibility that we made a mistake in branding that person that way and did so too quickly. So that's kind of the scenario that we see there in these types of bias. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Here's another video I want to show you. This was actually created by Price Waterhouse Coopers, a uh, firm that wanted to do diversity training. And uh, I think this is a really interesting uh, video. So let's take a look see. Are you seriously considering her as a I just candidate? Don't trust just him. don't trust her. She's a woman. She's a woman. This is a man's job. She's clearly not educated. Really not Does she educated. even speak English? That's not me. I'm not like that. You call it an honest mistake. Science calls it a blind spot. Our unconscious mind is a mysterious and powerful thing. It makes 90% of our decisions <coughs> without us even knowing it. Our brains are overloaded with 11 million pieces of information every second. Yet we can only process about 40 of them. So we're wired to make cognitive shortcuts using past experiences to make assumptions. And you know what happens when we assume. Our unconscious mind can put us on autopilot, determining where we sit, who we eat lunch with, who we turn to for advice, and who we choose to offer a helping hand. Living our lives with blind spots can put us in a tunnel. Same point of view, same decisions, same outcomes. We can find ourselves trapped in the land of snap judgments and misconceptions. We've all been on both the giving and receiving end of blind spots. Think about it. Who's talented? Who's able? Who can I trust? Who belongs? We've all been there. Blind spots are part of the human condition. Our choices have consequences for us and the people we interact with. By accepting that blind spots exist, we can stop. Imagine what possibilities exist if we could do it all over again. Different perspectives, inclusive relationships, diverse networks, better outcomes, seeing people for who they really are. People like you with unlimited potential. We all have blind spots. Once you accept that you have them, you can choose to do something about it. It's time to check your blind spots and focus on what's possible. Okay. So they teed that up for me. How do we address unconscious bias? You know, what do you do when you recognize, oh, I just looked at one of my blind spots. I finally saw what's there. Now I know it's there. What do I do about it? Well, the first way to kind of detect our biases is to notice what we call triggering events. These often point to an unconscious bias that's happening within us. By triggering, I mean something happens where you get an emotional response that's automatic. Uh, it might be fear. It might be anger. It might be anxiety. It could be any of those kind of things. That, and when you feel that when you first meet somebody or you're with a group of people or whatever, one of the things you might want to do again, is check in with yourself. Oh, did I just trip over one of my unconscious biases? Is that why I got triggered? And that's an important thing to do. Once you recognize that the bias is there, you need to own it. 
that doesn't mean you beat yourself up about it. Oh, I'm a racist. I have this unconscious bias about people of color. That doesn't mean you are intentionally wanting that. And if you become aware of it and recognize that it's not good and you want to change it, then obviously there's no reason to criticize yourself. But we do need to take responsibility for these things. That's not the same. Taking responsibility is not the same as, you know, beating ourselves up because we discover something in our psyche that we didn't know is there. And boy, we don't particularly like it. It's not consistent with our self-image, our values. Then you need to challenge that bias once you know it's there. Try to try to see past the stereotype that's operating in the brain and see the real person. And in order to do that, we generally know that you need to increase exposure, meaning you need to seek out persons and situations and stuff that'll challenge your bias. Now remember, that flies in the face of what we try to do when we get this cognitive dissonance. Oh, I can't believe I think that. You know, we try usually to put that away so we don't feel anxious about it. This is going to make you more anxious. <laughs> so increasing your exposure may amp up your anxiety, at least for a little while. But if you can seek out persons and situations where you have a bias and you have a bias towards those persons or situations, learn more, have more exposure, that's going to push back against it. Also disclose and discuss. This is a hard part for many of us, but we know research tells us that when you recognize a bias and then you admit it, meaning you talk to somebody about it, that that helps because it helps you to normalize it. Of course, unless that person jumps down your throat, you know, but ordinarily that friend or confidant is gonna say, yeah, I get it, I understand, I got some of those too. And then it sort of makes it okay and you don't get into the guilt trip about it. And then the other thing is once you've discovered an unconscious bias, owned it, challenged it, increased your exposure in order to have an impact on it, you still need to stay conscious of it. It's Sorry, real easy. Trouble hearing you. It's real easy for that unconscious bias, okay, to kind of go back into hiding if you don't keep it in your awareness. And so these things rarely just kind of disappear. Oh, there it is. Poof, it's gone. It's not like that. You have to remain vigilant because it's going to keep showing up in your perceptions, how you see people, how you react emotionally to people in situations, and how that drives your behavior. So once it's there, got to keep it in your awareness to some degree and guard against how it's shaping your interactions with other people. There's one other model that's kind of interesting in this regard. It's called the FLEX model. It's maybe a little easier to understand than the one I just gave you. FLEX stands for focus within, become aware of it, learn about others, meaning those others that are eliciting that bias, then engage in dialogue again with other people, with a confidant to try to get it out in the open instead of just having to swim around in your head and then expand, which is that exposure part. So sometimes if you want an acronym and boy, don't we love acronyms, um, just think about flex, okay? So bias is a rigid thing. Opening up and changing a bias is a flexible thing. That's why you call it the flex model. The other thing we know that really helps in transforming bias is empathy. So if you're an empathic person, and many are, then you have a basis upon which to create common emotional ground through empathy. And we know there's two forms of empathy. There's the cognitive kind, meaning I'm understanding the other person's experience intellectually, if you will. Okay, so let's say I'm in a conversation with somebody who's an African-American and they're telling me about what it's like to experience discrimination or racism in their life, in their neighborhood, in their job, whatever. I maybe have not had that experience, okay, myself, but I can understand it. I can understand it intellectually. If I have had that experience or if I'm highly empathic, I can go a step further and actually kind of walk in that person's shoes and get a sense for, boy, what would that be like, you know, if I experienced that? And then you can start to feel some of what it feels like to that person. As you can tell, when you do that, it really closes the gap, okay, in terms of us and them or me and other. So empathy pushes back against biases and stereotypes because it compels us to connect with the person rather than the stereotype. And that's where the real, the real power from it comes.
How do you get that? The other way we know that really helps is just to have conversations with people in which you talk about your respective experiences in life. Okay. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. said, <clears throat> it's hard to hate somebody once you've heard their story. <clears throat> and usually that's true. Uh, not always, but usually. So we also know that the oral tradition is really embedded in the human mind, which is where biases live, right? So the brain is a story processor more than a logic processor, which I'm sorry, Spock, I'm a big Spock fan, but he's just got to have to face up to this. The brain's a story processor, okay? It learns from stories, other people's stories, telling our own, hearing theirs, and so on and so forth. So sharing these life stories promotes that connectivity of common experience and reduces bias. Because the brain's a story processor at a deep level, ancient level, that was our first way of learning. That was our first way of sharing and developing culture was to share stories with each other. Because that's so deep-seated and ancient and powerful, it's a very good weapon, if you will, against an equally ancient and powerful tendency to sort people into categories and to instill unconscious bias. Okay. So, see I'm looking at the time here. These are the questions that I kind of came up with that I thought would be very helpful for folks to grapple with a little bit here today. Um, bringing it home, as we say. So, what is a bias you were once unconscious about that you now recognize? You know, before you, it was there and it was operating, but you didn't know it, and then something happened or someone pointed it out or you had an experience when you went, ah, uh -huh, there is one. <laughs> I do have a bias here. And while this bias was unconscious, how do you think it influenced your behavior? Because these usually do influence our behavior. Did it change the way you related to people? Did it, it have you exclude somebody rather than include them? Did you feel a wariness with somebody and therefore were less forthcoming or open with them as a result of the bias? I mean, the possibilities are endless, but that's the next thing to ask. Okay, I had this bias. How did it influence my behavior? And then also very importantly, how did you wake up to it? How did you know it was there? What happened to bring it into your awareness? Because usually it is some kind of a, at least a mini aha kind of moment that brings us into awareness of these biases. And once you became aware of this bias, what did you do to try to reduce or eliminate its impact on your behavior? So it's not enough, again, just to know it's there. You also have to use that knowledge as a way to guide your behavior going forward, okay? <clears throat> I want to give you a, a real quick story about that before it, you go in, and I'm not sure how you organize this, but to talk about these questions. And that quick story comes from my, <clears throat> my own experience. Um, um, I'm an adoptive parent. Um, both of my children come from South Korea. Okay. When I was a teenager, our family, when I was in high school, our family sponsored a foreign exchange student from Japan. So I had this prior exposure to an Asian, a person of Asian ethnicity, right, through this foreign exchange student. And I remember that while our family was very welcoming, he stayed with us for a whole year. Um, he was a great ahead of me. And he and I got along, got along pretty well. I became aware that I had certain biases about him based on that racial disparity. I had grown up in a town that was 100% white, okay? It was a little town, a little rural town in Illinois, and there were no people of color anywhere. So this young man shows up to live with our family, and we're all consciously, our value system is, hey, big tent, everybody come on in. You know, we accept all kind of thing. That was my value set. And I heard it coming out of my parents' mouths. But I was aware at some point of a little bit of that unconscious bias started to bubble up into my conscience. I became aware of it. I didn't like it. <laughs> I didn't like the fact that I always had this conflict between what I believed what we should be on, racial, on a racial basis and what I felt at an emotional level. Then, of course, I did what we usually do. I forgot about it and, you know, kind of moved on from there. And then when my wife and I decided we were going to adopt and we decided we would adopt from Korea, I came face to face with that bias again, very personally, in a very personal way, my children. Okay. And I had to bring that bias clearly into my awareness 
look in the mirror, be honest with myself, if there were elements of it that were still there and go after them, okay? And that's the process that gives you kind of example of what I'm talking about, okay? So Marguerite, I'm gonna kind of cue you up. That was wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah. My pleasure. You're always a great group. Okay.